بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هنبدا اليوم الثاني ان شاء الله الفعاليات المؤتمر والحقيقه لازم في البدايه نشكر الاستاذ الدكتور اشرف حاتم رئيس المؤتمر والاخ العزيز الاستاذ الدكتور احمد الحلفاوي على المجهود الرائع والمؤتمر والمحتوى العلمي الاكثر من رائع. It is my pleasure to open this session risk reduction intervention in pulmonology and it is my honor to call Professor Alice Rosman. Alice Rosman is a professor of pulmonary medicine, Sulfenia, to talk about embyema, evidence, and experience. invite me to this uh, very, very organized and nice Congress. I was here already a year and two years ago, and every time I'm surprised with the level of the uh, lectures and talks which we have here. So I'll try in the short words to present you MPEMA, evidence and experience. So I won't lose much words. I just show that MPEMA is, uh, and uh, plural infections, the incidence is increasing in the last years. We don't know exactly the cause. But we know that the incidence is increasing also in the younger generation and also in the, among the, uh, the older population. The majority of people, patients with community-acquired pneumonia has some kind of pleural effusion. The majority, only small amount, but in approximately 5 to 7 percent, it may develop into complex effusion and in some of them in the complex empyema. When the patients have uh, uh, infectious pleural effusion, the median duration of hospital stay is prolonged to approximately 14 days, and approximately one quarter of the patients stay in the hospital more than one month. And the majority use also the chest tube, and in one third of these patients with the empyema, the treatment with the chest tube fails and they have to be surgically treated and the mortality at one rate is in this group of patients 20% which is very high. 30 day mortality in the patients with MPM and community acquired uh, pneumonia is on average 4.9% but we have to, to uh, have the, in the account that this po uh, population is very complex with their comorbidities and elderly patients. But if the pleural effusion is um, associated with that, the mortality increases three times. And if there is a bilateral pleural effusion, which is usually the sign of also a cardiac failure, the mortality increases almost two times. So stages of MPEMA. Uh, here we see the simple exudate is usually a straw colored pH is not below 7.2, but the main point where we have to be very cautious is here. The difference between complicated exudate and MPEMA. So here we have a very bad biochemistry, acidic uh, effusion with, with very low glucose, but it's still free flowing. So there is no septations. But here it can happen in a matter of several hours. The MPEMA is formed and pus and fibrin is multiloculated. And then it's not so simple to remove it anymore. And then we have the stage three empyema, which is usually a surgical disease. So principles of empyema and uh, complicated empyema uh, management are, so we should be very fast here when the patient have the pleural effusion, we should very quickly um, diagnose it, whether it needs evacuation or not evacuation. So we start with antibiotic treatment, low molecular weight heparis, nutritional support, fluids. Usually these patients have problems with malnutrition as well, of any case. Uh, then if there is uh, acidic or complicated pleural effusion or pus, the chest tube is required in combination of interpleural treatment and also surgery if you cannot evacuate the effusion. So the main points here is prompt check strix ray evaluation with the uh, ultrasound. So we don't want to have such type of MPMA. We want to be faster to react when there is still flow, free flow effusion and of course thoracosynthesis to, to prove um, whether the biochemistry is not okay. 
Predictors of worst outcome were published two years ago. We see if this uh, five prognostic factors like uh, renal failure, advanced age, purulent fluid, infectious source, either community or hospital, and diet and factors, by the and nutrition, uh, uh, very influence the prognosis of the patient. Where this score is low, we have a very good, as you see on the red line on the graph, uh, very good prognosis, but when this score is high, we have a very bad prognosis. This is the blue line on the, uh, on, on the other side. So, septated effusion in comparison is the simple. It has uh, the lowest success rate of treatment, patients stay longer in the hospital, a higher rate of ICU admission, increased surgical rate and increased mortality, all the factors of worse outcome. So the treatment goals here are the quick relief of the sepsis, the patient uh, doesn't have high temperature anymore and, uh, and is better, then mortality is reduced. And we also want to prevent complications as they are trapped lung, fibrothorax, fistula, chronic empyema, and a situation, of course, which leads to surgical intervention and thoracotomy at the end. Uh, we also want to be uh, cost efficient, to reduce the hospital stay, and overall reduce the cost. So here we want to stop this cascade. We want to remove the pleural fluid when the biochemistry is not favorable, and we want to do this on the simple way. If we cross this line when the pleural fluid is septated, then we have to do much more work and be more aggressive for the patient. Here is one study which I think you know very well. It's a MIST 2 study published in 2011 with the interpleural treatment, randomization in four groups, in four arms, placebo, tissue plasminogen activated, DNA, this and combined group. And I think that I, I, I want to repeat this, that the combination of uh, tissue plasminogen activator and DNA is proved the benefit, but all the other groups uh, were not better than placebo, or actually were even worse than placebo if you just take DNS into account. Where here thoracoscop thoracoscopy and surgery take place? In recently, the American Association of Thoracic Surgery put as a level of evidence B uh, and uh, class A that a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery or thoracoscopy, sh thoracoscopy should be the first line approach in all patients with stage two acute empyema. So when there are septations already present, proven by ultrasound, the first line is not a chest tube anymore, recommended not a chest tube anymore, but just, uh, but simple intervention just to, to break these adhesions and to evacuate the fluid. So uh, complete evacuation of the potentially infected fluid is the goal and complete re-expansion of the lung. Where is the evidence for that? We would say we don't have much evidence, but evidence is there for almost 100 years. Because in 2000, 1925, the uh, beginner of thoracoscopy, Jacobius, already published 100, 100 cases of MPM treated successfully by thoracoscopy. And of course, thoracoscopy, thoracoscopy was invented for adhesiolysis of the uh, tuberculosis pleuritis in order to facilitate the pneumothorax treatment. And of course, there are some other publications. This one, especially at the end, I will go into a little bit more details with that. We also have one randomized uh, study from the year, I think it was, was 97, 1997, small group of patients. Patients were randomized to either chest uh, tube pleural treatment and streptokinesis or video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. But here I have to remind you that these patients were not stratified with the ultrasound. So no septations were proven before before the, uh, uh, the treatment, but as can you see, the, uh, the outcome was much more successful in the surgical group than in just conservative group. This uh, study was performed by uh, its uh, retrospective series of 127 patients by Brucher German Group. Medical thoracoscopy was primarily successful in 91% of the cases, and if uh, interpleural fibrinolytic was added at the end of the procedure, there was additional few percent which improved the prognosis. So, study published on this field are not, there, there's not very much of them. Here we can see the success rate of this one. This blue one are medical thoracoscopy, the white one was surgical thoracoscopy, and as you see in septated diffusions, the success rate is very high. And again, another one, a smaller from Italy. So I'll go quickly. I'll just show a case of 35 year old patient, female with parapneumonic effusion in PMS stage two, septated already. Uh, it was not possible to remove it, so we proceeded with uh, thoracoscopy. Just to see, I'll just start both videos. So you can see there's a lot of this uh, fibrin, main brain, and, and, and 
uh, pass. And first, we just break this membrane with the forceps, and then we peel some of this fibrin away in order to create one pleural cavity to remove all the fluid. It's not even necessary to remove all the fibrin out, but just to remove it, uh, to create one pleural space, and facilitate the healing. So, okay, after thoracoscopy, you still see here some sequelae. The pleura was elevated, still some infiltration because of this fibrin, but the patient went into respiratory physiotherapy, and after six weeks, was practically complete response. Okay, st here you can still see some uh, thickening of the pleura, but the uh, patient was discharged several days later at home and was pretty fine. Difference between medical thoracoscopy and surgical. Uh, medical is more easy, endoscopy suit, local anesthesia, moderate sedation, and spontaneous brief in patients. Surgical needs uh, uh, general anesthesia and single line ventilation in intubated patients. So for conclusion, I would like just to say that medical thoracos thoracoscopy and also video assisted thoracoscopic surgery is more or less the same, except that the level of anesthesia is higher, is effective and safe method of choice for the first line treatment of stage two MPEMA, septated parapneumonic effusion. And the ultrasound certification before, surg before procedure is mandatory. If you don't have the septa, this procedure is not justified because just the chest tube would solve the problem. But if you have the septi, and, or if you are unable to evacuate the fluid uh, by chest tube, then this is a very nice procedure to make the healing and recovery of the patient faster. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis. And uh, since you've spared a couple of minutes, if anyone has a question, Thank you very much for your illuminating tour. To continue the historical event, the Egyptian and the Arabian leaders, uh, Abu Bakr al-Razi and Ibn Nafis, Ibn, uh, Abu Bakr uh, Ibn Nafis make a book which is called The Kanun. It is one million words, and he his book for the uh, uh, Europe and the other, it is called the Bible of Medicine. The Bible of Medicine. He is the first to differentiate between plural disease and parenchymitis lung disease and to do postural treatment to evacuate pus in the uh, pleural cavity and how the patient can do respiratory exercise. And uh, his book has been translated to all the language and while Europe was in the dark age, it continued to be the book to be teaches in all universities for 300 years. The same do Zahrawi in Indonesia. Uh, the European people consider him the leader of modern surgery. He do also the evacuation of pus from the pleural cavity and from the peritoneal cavity. He described 220 new onusments. He is the first to do general anesthesia by a sponge. He, he is the, uh, also, he have done uh, many uh, original uh, operations, even to evacuate pus from the uh, pericardium in, in, uh, in, in the same time. He is the first to describe the Fowler and the Trimbeng operation. So we have to say that the credit uh, in, in uh, the history of dealing with such diseases is due to the Arab leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. I'm aware of this very old book, but I don't know the details, but thank you for reminding us for that. Thank you very much, Alice. We will come again. <laughs> and now I have the pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Levin Delar, who's a professor of um, respiratory medicine in uh, Turkey. He will give us a talk about safe pre-medication and sedation for bronchoscopy. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. I will summarize the safe pre-medication and the sedation in, uh, for bronchoscopy in 15 minutes, which is impossible. 
Uh, I will start with Tibetan proverb, the man who is obsessed by lift cannot see the tree anymore. You will uh, see some pictures during the presentation. It's about uh, uh, sedation in our life. This is my outline. There is no standardized practice for the use of sedation in bronchoscopy, as you know. Just uh, one specific guidance being published by the ACCP. Uh, and the is not guide, not guide is a consensus statement. One of them. Is sedation really necessary? It's the uh, good question. One study suggested that aldomyidazolam may facilitate the performance of the procedure for the operator. It does not improve patient comfort. Another study showed that with the proper patient selection, awake bronchoscopy is well tolerated. Majority of physicians now use pharmacological sedatives, as me, and anxiolytics, improving procedural tolerance and patient satisfaction. The choice of sedation is generally left to the practice pattern of the performing bronchoscopist. Moderate sedation defined as a drug-induced decreased level of consciousness in which the patient is able to respond to verbal comments with adequate spontaneous ventilation and normal cardiovascular function. This is the aim. A consensus statement from ACCP, optimal procedural conditions are achieved when patients are comfortable, physicians are able to perform the procedure, and risk is minimized. Studies comparing bronchoscopy with and without sedation found no difference in rates of complication. This is the important point. Without sedation was thought to be safe. These studies, however, did not assess patient tolerance, comfort, or willingness to undergo a, rep to undergo a repeat procedure. The procedure itself is uh, very well known, uncomfortable, with patients often experiencing difficulty breathing, cough, pain, uh, fear, anxiety, and airway irritation. The use of sedation during bronchoscopy has improved outcomes, such as patient tolerance reduction in cough and patient likelihood to undergo a repeat future procedure without increased complications. So, what's the pre-medication drugs? Anticholinergic drugs is well-known drugs, but we don't use anymore. Compared, uh, compared intramuscular atropine and glucoprolate to placebo, Cole and colleagues found no significant benefit in the use of anticholinergics in reducing secretions, cough and complication rates, or in increasing patient comfort. Despite demonstrating a reduction in airway secretion, Malik and colleagues found no benefits on patient comfort, Oxygen desaturation all the time it took to complete the procedure, and there were greater hemodynamic fluctuations and rising blood pressure. Another drug is clonidin, a centrally acting alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, have been used to, due to the sympolytic effects on the cardiovascular system that may reduce the incidence of arrhythmias, myocardial infection during bronchoscopy, which is often associated with tachycardia and hypertension probably not used more frequently due to prolonged sedative effects of oral administration. Another drug, labetalol and alpha-1 and beta-1, beta-2 antagonist, used for its ability to reduce peripheral vascular resistant and arterial blood pressure without causing a reflex tachycardia, found no beneficial effect with labetalol. Another drug, dextrametorphan, non-competitive uh, m methyl diaspartate receptor antagonist with antitussive properties have been used in bronchoscopy with midozolam sedation by Schwartz and the colleagues. Whether analgesia and patient comfort with dextromotorphan will, uh, has achieved. What about topical anesthesia? Commonly used either alone or as, it, uh, as an adjunct to a systemic medication to optimize the procedure available in solution, gel, or spray, can be administered as syringe, soaked cotton pads, spray nebulizer, nerve block, transcricoid or transtracheal injection. Widely used that can be administered in direct drip solution, I do uh, the same, nebulized spray or gel forms. By decreasing ion transport across neural membranes, it blocks nerve impulse conduction, affording properties of anesthesia and cough suppression. Randomized control trial by Antoniades compared direct administration of lidocaine through a bronchoscope with placebo and found a signif significant reduction in both cough and total required sed uh, sedation. 
Topical anesthesia is important part of the bronchoscopy. Cardiac and neurological toxicity are dose related and often seen when the serum level exceeds 5 mg liter or topical dose is greater than 7 mg kg. Close monitoring of the amount of lidocaine used recommended, especially for prolonged cases and the procedures performed in pediatric patients and also in elderly. Studies have found no significant difference in the anesthetic properties of uh, or reduction in cough 1% versus 2% concentration of lidocaine suggesting that the lower concentration is less likely to lead to potential uh, toxicity. Another way uh, to perform the local anesthesia with lidocaine transcricoid or transtracheal direct injection, lidocaine or lignocaine, the upper trachea is anesthetized by injection via the cricotroid membrane or between the tracheal rings. This approach is thought to be associated with a reduction in cough and improved patient tolerance when compared with nebulizer or directly administered lidocaine through the working channel of the bronchoscope without an increased complication. Graham and the colleagues only found minimal intratracheal mucosal bleeding and no significant difference in complication rates. But the workload is uh, increasing with this type of uh, approach. And the wish drugs for uh, sedation. Benzodiazepine act via the potentiation of central inhibitory neurons, neurotransmitter. The class of medication has been favored in bronchoscopic procedures because of their anxiolytic, hypnotic, muscle relaxant, and anterograde amnestic properties, especially anterograde amnestic properties. Availability of a reversal agent. There is many options, midazolam, diazepam, tamazepam, and uh, lorazepam. Midazolam is most widely favored for its rapid onset and peak effect of and short half time. In placebo versus benzodiazepine administration, patients support increased procedural tolerance and increased likelihood of undergoing a repeat procedure. When compared with opioids, benzodiazepines offer better amnesia and lower risk of respiratory depression. In about six of the population, six percent of the population, benzodiazepines metabolize slowly, causing systemic accumulation of the drug, thus increasing the risk profile. Other drawbacks include numerous drug interactions and variability in drug tolerance at the level of uh, some hepatic uh, enzymes, thus resulting in respiratory depression, memory changes, especially in elderly and in patients with kidney or liver disease. The preferred agent for sedation in bronchoscopy is midazolam, as it has a rapid peak effect and relatively short half time, to as compared with diazepam. In the ACCP survey, about 50% of respondents use midazolam as compared with the next common diazepam with uh, about 25 usage among respondents. Many studies have evaluated patient satisfaction with midazolam. In a randomized double-blind uh, prospective study, bronchoscopy use, utilizing midazolam sedation versus placebo was done. In all accounts, the midazolam group had a better tolerance of the procedure. In 2012, in Portugal, with the same conclusion, increased comfort and the decreased fear and anxiety of the patient. And opiates, opiates act as, as agonists on the mu receptor, resulting in analges analgesia, sedation, and block of cough reflux, as with benzodiazepine. The availability of a reversal agent, naloxone, makes opiates ideal. Fentanyl is the most commonly used due to its lipophilic properties, rapid onset, and the short half-life. Remifentanil is another one, also has a short half-life and has been studied together with propofol in infants. Using opiates alone for sedation has not been extensively studied. However, in three studies, opiates have been found to be inferior to benzodiazepine when used as single agents. Mostly used in combination with other drugs such as benzodiazepine or propofol. Should be administered before any other agent. Uh, it helps with the suppression of cough, reduces lidocaine usage, and increases patient procedural tolerance. The synergy between benzodiazepine and opiates allow for better patient tolerance for bronchoscopy. Uh, in a study in Taiwan, uh, there was more patient satisfaction with sedation, which is seen by the willingness of patients to come back for a second bronchoscopy. In the same study, it was observed that more patients had dyspnea, 
after bronchoscopy in the non-sedated group versus the group who received the combination sedation. Desaturation episodes during the procedure were common. However, desaturations was not sustained. Another one is propofol. Similar to the benzodiazepine, the mechanism of action of propofol is, uh, in sedation is by increasing the activity of GABA. In the first study of midazolam versus propofol, propofol was found to have a shorter recovery time with a comparable side effect profile to midazolam, thus it was found to be a suitable sedative for bronchoscopy. The shorter recovery time allows for quicker patient discharge. Uh, with propofol, it was found that there was no difference in the arterial oxygen saturation during bronchoscopy, where propofol excelled was in the readiness for discharge, making it uh, at times more appealing than the benzodiazepine options. I have to be faster. <laughs> the safety profile is of propofol was further analyzed with the measurement, measurement of transcutaneous carbon dioxide tension monitoring. Small boluses of propofol at short intervals did not produce respiratory drive depression. In fact, the midazolam alpha antenna branch in the study had higher carbon, uh, carbon dioxide tension values after bronchoscopy. The study concluded that the both midazolam and propofol are safe to use in bronchoscopy. The mode of giving propofol has also been recently evaluated in bronchoscopy, continuous inf infusion versus intermittent bolus. It was found that the safety profile of bolus and continuous propofol were similar. So who should administer propofol? It is the major question. British guidelines state that propofol should only be used when administered by practitioners formally trained as it has a narrow therapeutic window. Non-anesthesiologist has been a point of contention as deeper than expected sedation can be achieved. Propofol was administered by nurses who had completed training protocol in a study. In the nurse administered propofol sedation trial, the adverse event supported was about uh, 3%, which is on par with the rate of complication reported in other bronchoscopy suite studies, showed that NAPS is useful, safe, and cost-effective. Another one is phospropofol, is water-soluble product of propofol with a unique pharmacokinetic profile, can easily be titrated to produce moderate sedation and is, is not considered to be a general anesthetic. The major side effects of phospropofol were paresthesia, pruritus, hypoxemia, and hypotension. Uh, phospropofol has been studied in elderly patients and has been shown to be a safe sedative during bronchoscopy due to its predictable pharmac pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile. Another one, dexmethodomidin, it can induce bradycardia and hypotension. Patient satisfaction was similar in dexmethodomidin group, but patient's assessment of cough was higher in the, uh, this group. What about the combinations? The use of co a combination of benzodiazepine and opioids is increasing the popularity, and uh, as it offers the antitussic properties of opioids and with the amnestic effect of benzodiazepine. Uh, several studies noted better patient tolerance and cough reduction in the combination arms. These studies also found greater oxygen desaturation in the combination arms compared with benzodiazepines alone, but noted no adverse events that were clinically relevant. Another one, ketamine, uh, it's uh, non-competitive m methyl d aspartate receptor antagonist and parcel mu agonist. Uh, dissociative anesthesia and does not significantly affect ventilatory drive. Has analgesic and bronchodilator properties, but can also potentiate airway secretion, sympathetic drive, and em emergence delirium. Most common side effects uh, of it in, uh, is delirium and the hallucinations. Another one is the new drug, Remimazolam, novel short-acting GABA receptor agonist. In SHIP, have shown that Remimazolam has a more rapid one set of action and a shorter duration of action compared with Midazolam, but was as associated with more pronounced respiratory depression and hypotension, similar to Propofol. This means out of time. Sorry for that. There is a new prospective double-blind randomized multicenter parallel group trial was performed at 30 U.S. sites. The success rates were 80% in 
in the remozolam arm and 5% in the placebo arm and the, about 33% in the midozolam arm. I can move it. Okay. What about the complementary medicine? There is no effect in summary. Elderly people, uh, the elderly typically require smaller doses of sedative medications because of higher likelihood of poor hepatic metabolism or renal dysfunction and often have prolonged emergence time. In patients where the arm brain circulation time, time taken for the drug to travel from the injection site to the brain and have its central nervous system effect is prolonged. Those adjustments may also be required in substance misusers, recipients of stem cell transplants, patients, patients with cystic fibrosis. What about COPD? Uh, respiratory complications occurred more often in patients with severe to very severe COPD compared with patients without COPD. Uh, generally, bronchoscopy is generally safe in COPD patients with few complications, but uh, in patients with severe to very severe COPD who underwent flexible bronchoscopy, the rep respiratory complication rate was higher compared with uh, patients without or uh, less severe COPD. What about in electromagnetic navigation? sedation should be uh, choiced. Diagnostic yield and overall success of the procedures does not seem to be affected by the type of the sedation used. And in Navigate Studies, study uh, which published recently, general anesthesia was used 80% of procedures and moderate sedation was used in uh, 20%. What about a bus? The ideal type of sedation EBAS procedures is an important question for bronchoscopists as they seek, in the, uh, the seek the best conditions to optimize their diagnostic yield, enhance patient, patient's comforts and avoid complications. Uh, the retrospective study by Yarmus uh, and colleagues assessed uh, uh, about 300 patients from two separate uh, institutions and multiple procedures performing EBUS with moderate or deep sedation. The authors found a statistical, uh, statistically significant benefit of deep sedation use on diagnostic yield in a multivariable analysis. What about the guide, uh, the SCCP guide, chest guide? They uh, recommended in patients undergoing EBUS, EBUS TBNA, we suggest that either moderate or deep sedation is an acceptable approach. Grade 2C, this means weak recommendation. There is no evidence uh, yet. So must, uh, my last two slides. And ideal sedatives should be easy to use, have a rapid one set, short duration of action, rapid recovery with return uh, of cognition, predictable pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic dynamic profile, not altered by interactions with other drugs, should be reversible with a predictable and specific, specific antagonist. So propofol is an important agent for moderate sedation with benefits for patients and should be alternative to current sedation regimes in procedurals administered sedation, provided the user is appropriately trained and local guidelines allow. This is the important part of the usage. Midozolam in combination with a short-acting opioid, fentanyl or alfentanyl, remain the pharmacological agents of choice for procedurals administered sedation in bronchoscopy. Timely discharge is a priority. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Salos, uh, Professor Dilar, for your excellent, well illustrated uh, talk. And it is my pleasure uh, to call one of the eminent uh, international speaker, Professor Simra, is one of the executive committee for American College of Chest Physicians. She was also uh, the former president for uh, European Association for Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology. Professor Simra will talk uh, about uh, rationale and good clinical practice in interventional bronchoscopy. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's my 10th time or maybe 15th visit to Cairo and Egypt. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And as Alej said, this meeting is becoming better and better every year. The quality, scientific quality is increasing. And I am very happy to be here. I think I deserve this citizenship 
for Egypt next year, you should give it. If you don't give it, I won't come. <laughs> uh, let's come to rational approach and good clinical practices in interventional pulmonology. Interventional pulmonology is minimally invasive diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, as you all know. It involves bronchoscopic and transthoracic procedures. They can be therapeutic procedures for palliative purposes, curative purposes for malignant or benign diseases, or they can be done for diagnostic purposes in many different diseases. What is good clinical practice? It is international ethical and scientific quality standard, and it includes ethics, which is ethical conduct of clinical practice, benefits justifying risk, rights, safety, well-being of patients, and the quality, it includes data, scientific quality, ethical quality, process quality, risk and risk management, and also validation and verification and inspection. Good clinical practice has always the patient safety and quality of patient care in the core, and there are uh, supporting uh, why did it, the supporting items are patient safety and quality of patient care relating to patients, communication and interpersonal skills, collaboration and teamwork, management, which includes self-management, scholarship, professionalism, and clinical skills. But the main item is the patient safety and quality of patient care. I think this table, this four box table should be glued to the wall of the bronchoscopy unit or in all medical departments because it's the, how we say, the summary, the abstract of whole medical management. It's called patient-centered practical approach. Main items, initial evaluation, procedural strategies and planning, procedural techniques and results, and the last one, long-term management plan. In initial evaluation, you have physical examination, complementary tests, patient's comorbidities, including a patient support system, which also includes the family, and patient preferences and expectations, again, including the family. Procedural strategies and planning, this is very important because you have to have the right indications, contraindications, and expected results operator and team experience and expertise, risk benefits analysis and therapeutic alternatives, and also respect for persons, which is informed consent and ethics issues. The third one, procedural techniques and results, anesthesia and other perioperative care techniques and instrumentation, anatomic dangers and other risks, and results and procedure-related complications. When you finish the procedure, it's not done. You have to follow up the patient. It's long-term management plan. You cannot say, okay, I finished the procedure, go away. No, you have to marry the patient. So you have to see the outcome assessment, follow up tests, visits, and procedures, referrals to medical, uh, surgical, or palliative care, or end-of-life care. And also, you should assess the quality uh, have you improved your, in your procedures, so quality improvement and team evaluation of clinical uh, encounter should be done. Let's come to appropriate and suitable indications. In a case with airway obstruction, to do interventional procedures, you have to have symptoms. Mostly it's dyspnea. It can be hemoptysis or some other symptom. In airway obstruction, most, mostly it's dyspnea. If you don't have dyspnea in the patient, why should you do the interventional pulmonary procedure, which is minimally invasive? So you have to have a symptom due to the airway obstruction. This is also important. The patient may have dyspnea due to another cause, not to the obstruction, and opening that obstruction won't help the patient. So the obstruction should be due to the airway uh, the symptom should be due to the airway obstruction. And another important thing, the patient should have a sufficient length of life expectancy. If she, the patient is near dying, why should you do the interventional pulmonary procedure? 
uh, in appropriate suitable indications, another important point is visible anatomic borders of obstructive lesion. You should be able to see the anatomic borders of the obstructive lesion because you can cause dangers if you don't know the boundaries of it. And also, there should be a functional airway or lung parenchyma distal to obstruction. You may have a central airway obstruction, but if the distal parenchyma or distal airway is not functioning well, opening the door <laughs> doesn't give any benefit to the patient. Okay, maybe the interventional pulmonologist may become very satisfied with his skills, but it does not benefit the patient. So you have to plan. Very important thing usually missed by many doctors is pulmonary artery and cardiac invasion. You may have a central airway obstruction and the patient is dyspneic, but if you see the PETs, PET CT or just CT and see the cardiac invasion or pulmonary artery invasion, opening that central airway obstruction again won't benefit the patient. Why? there is a perfusion defecto. It's something like pulmonary embolism, occluding or compressing the pulmonary artery, plus cardiac invasion, as you see here, is left atrial invasion. Although you open the airway, the patient won't say to you, oh, I am very comfortable now. No, because there are two different reasons for dyspnea. So there is no benefit from ablative treatment and stenting uh, in this type of patient. You should always have rational algorithms when you plan your procedures. When you have central airway obstruction, always ask the question, is it life-threatening? If the answer is no, you can use flexible bronchoscopy, do the regular procedures. If the patient is operable, send the patient to surgery. If the patient uh, is not operable, then ask again, is the patient symptomatic? Uh, is the obstruction more than 50% of the lumen? If yes, you can do therapeutic endoscopy. If no, you have time. You can do radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and if there is recurrence, you can do endoscopic procedures. If the central airway obstruction is like threatening, then use rigid bronchoscopy and do therapeutic endoscopy if the patient's performance status is fitting for this. Another uh, significant point is whether the lesion is intraluminal or extraluminal when you have central airway obstruction. If it's completely intraluminal, again ask, is there high risk for bleeding and respiratory failure? If yes, use general anesthesia and rigid bronchoscopy and do the indicated procedure. If no, you can use flexible bronchoscopy under local anesthesia and do the procedures, and in time, if necessary, uh, to maintain airway patency in long term, you can add treatments such as stenting, brachytherapy, external radiotherapy. If the lesion is completely extraluminal, you have to use stent under general anesthesia. In case of benign tracheal or central airway obstruction, you should have, again, good algorithm. If it should be, first of all, symptomatic to do the procedures, and then we, most of the time, use rigid bronchoscopy. If it's simple, short stenosis, if it's just in the mucosa and web-like, you can use dilatation together with a hot treatment like laser, electrocautery, and if it relapses, you can repeat the procedure three times, but after the third relapse, think about surgery. If everything is stable, you can observe the patient maybe two years. In case of complex stenosis, always consult the thoracic surgeon. Complex stenosis involves the cartilage, the wall of the airway together with the mucosa. You cannot do it just by interventional procedures. If the patient is operable, he or she goes to surgery, but if the patient is not operable, stenting is an option. And for two years, that stent stays. After two years, you can re remove the stent and see the result. If there is relapse, surgery can be an option. If non-operable, stenting. If the patient is stable, just observe. And very good, how you say, rule. Uh, it came from United States because 
If you use metallic stents in B9 cases, since they live longer, in time, uh, the metal parts go into mucosa and even surgery cannot help in those patients. For B9 diseases, if there is central airway obstruction, use only silicone stents. You can use silicone stents for malignant diseases too and use metal stents only for malignant tumors because their life expectancy is short. Regarding appropriate suitable indications, uh, we should be careful about curative treatment for early stage lung cancer. These patients may go to surgery, some of them may have endoscopic procedures, but be careful about accurate staging before curative treatment. Always think that lung cancer is a multicentric disease. You may find a carcinoma in situ or microinvasive cancer at some point, but it may be appearing at another location. So do the accurate staging, maybe not all of these tests, but you should have PET, maybe autofluorescence bronchoscopy, local staging with EBUS, and also look at the tumor behavior, cost effectiveness of the procedure, and quality of life with using the procedure. Let's come to the selection of COPD patients to bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. It's a, another area of interventional pulmonology. You have to have the uh, appropriate pulmonary function tests to give the patient this endoscopic uh, treatment. FEV1 should be between 20 to 45 percent, and residual volume should be at least 150 percent or even more. And you should uh, assess the patient what, with using one millimeter thick volumetric high resolution computed tomography, which is quantitative CT for density and fissure analysis. After that, you look at the emphysema distribution, whether it's heterogeneous or homogeneous. Heterogeneous means the, the density difference be between upper and lower lobe is more than 15 percent. After you classify as heterogeneous and homogeneous, you look at the fissure integrity. If there is no collateral ventilation, you do bronchoscopic lung volume reduction with valves, maybe sometimes surgery. If there is no fissure integrity and there is collateral ventilation, look at the, the parenchymal destruction. If it's slow, do bronchoscopic lung volume reduction with coils or surgery. If the destruction is high, use sealants uh, glue or vapor, very sometimes surgery. In homogeneous emphysema, there is not much experience, but there are studies coming out that endoscopic lung volume reduction can be used in homogeneous emphysema. If the parenchymal destruction is low, again, you look at the fissure integrity. If there is fissure integrity, no collateral ventilation, use valves. If there is no fissure integrity, you can again use coils and sealants, but in homogeneous emphysema, if there is high parenchymal destruction, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction is contraindicated. Let's look at uh, asthma, severe asthma. In my country, at least in my hospital, there are many patients named or diagnosed as asthma but when you look into detail, they are not asthma patients. They have other diseases like congestive heart failure or some other disease. Their dyspnea is not due to asthma, so be sure about asthma diagnosis and then decide whether the patient has received optimal asthma treatment medically. If he or she has received optimal medical asthma treatment, then look at the patient. Is it severe uncontrolled asthma or not? because we use bronchothermoplasty only for severe uncontrolled asthma, and the definition is they should have received optimal asthma treatment. Um, sorry. After that, after filtering so much, you can ask the patient, do you want thermoplasty, and do the procedure. So uh, from my viewpoint, bronchothermoplasty cannot be applied to too many asthma patients if you filter this much.
let's come to EBUS TBNA. It's such a fashionable procedure in my hospital, in my country, in the whole world. It's very popular. But when you look at the indications, do we have to push this EBUS needle into every lymph node? I mean, what I observe in my hospital, everyone is enthusiastic. They want to push that needle into the every lymph, lymph node they see. No, this is not the case. This shouldn't be the case. Have good indications like, uh, for EBUS tBNA. For staging lung cancer, a patient who looks operable, uh, resectable, okay. For staging, EBUS tBNA is good. You can do almost complete staging and send the patient to surgery. But if that patient has a tumor invading the mediastinum and some lymph nodes, do you need staging? No, the patient won't go to surgery. Why should you use EBUS tBNA? You may use, but you have your conventional methods, conventional tBNA, conventional bronchoscopic methods. What I am mentioning about is to use your sources cost effectively, rationally. Of course, we can use the most luxurious methods for everything, but is it correct or is it just to do? So be uh, careful with the indications. In nodules, for example, in pulmonary nodules, there are many diagnostic procedures done nowadays. There are therapeutic procedures for nodules who are th that look malignant or that appear to be malignant. First of all, in a case of nodule, you have to assess the past films, past radiographs. Maybe it's stable, it doesn't need any procedure. If you don't look at the past archives, you will do, do some unnecessary procedures. After that, look at the nature of the uh, nodule, the borders, the appearance in the film, in the uh, CTs. They may have some clues for benign futures or malignant futures, and then you have to look at the risk. Some patients cannot have every procedure because of their performance status or comorbidities. So you have to decide by the appearance of the nodule, the nature of the nodule, the risks the patient has, plus uh, the, how you say, the progression of the nodule. So you should have a nice algorithm and rice national to go to some procedures. Otherwise, you may use electromagnetic navigation radial probe EBUS for a nodule that is not requiring any procedure if you do not assess the patient uh, in detail. This is a very nice article by Dr. Atul Mehta and colleagues that appeared in CHESS this year in January, I think. It looks a little bit absurd at the beginning, but not. It's very uh, logical. It says there are many bronchoscopies, diagnostic or interventional done, but they are not required. If you do not assess the patient clinically, radiologically, from the archives, uh, you can do a lot of unnecessary procedures and may cause complications and also spend a lot of money. It's not cost effective. For example, uh, when you look at the uh, table, uh, the lymph adenopathies in cystic fibrosis, smear negative pulmonary TB, hemoptysis, uh, atelectasis in patients receiving mechanical ventilation, fibrosing mediastinitis, some pulmonary nodules, some pleural effusions, lymph nodes in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, the lymph nodes in congestive heart failure, this is very frequent, sarcoidosis stage one cases, in some cases of lymphoma, and other diseases. You have to choose the right patient for uh, diagnostic procedures by bronchoscopy. And for the team of the interventional team, which includes interventional pulmonologist, nurse, and assisting personnel, they should thoroughly know how to run the equipment and they should know the safety procedures. If only a doctor knows it, it doesn't help. It's a teamwork. And this interventional procedure or interventional pulmonology management should be the most ideal management regarding patient, hospital team, experience, equipment, and budget. And sometimes uh, you have to assess the risk 
and potential benefit. And if the patient is a risky patient, say a very dyspneic patient has a lot of risks for the interventional procedure, but you have to balance. By doing this interventional procedure, which may look risky, maybe benefiting the patient. You have to balance and plan before the procedure. The whole team of interventional pulmonary department should have situational awareness. I think in surgery, this is also very important in whole medicine. What is situational awareness? Is perception within a volume of time and space. What does it benefit? It prevents disasters in high risk environments and during crisis. If you know that danger can come or is coming, you are ready with your uh, preparations. So if you are not aware of the risk or danger, you won't be able to do anything during the time of danger or complication. Cost effectiveness is important for the whole world. Even the richest countries are doing these cost effectiveness studies. Why shouldn't we do it? So cost effectiveness is potential benefit at some cost, and we should be careful for, uh, with the priorities in healthcare expenditures and there should be cost effectiveness in new technology. We should always get informed consent before the procedures. That protects the patient, but that also protects the doctor legally. You, you should have written documents. You cannot say, we ask the patient, no. It should be written and signed. There should be a checklist for IP procedures, interventional pulmonary procedures. I won't go deep into detail. Having these checklists, alarms you, reminds you. We are human beings, we may forget little detail, but th that little detail may cause complications during the procedure. Sedation and anesthesia, I won't go deep into detail. My friend Levant mentioned uh, it very well, but I will say most of the time, conscious sedation under local anesthesia is enough for many procedures. I'm not saying do not use general anesthesia, but a little bit, be a little bit stingy when using sedation. Avoid insufficient excessive sedation. Always titrate the drug. Give little amount, like two milligrams of midazolam, IV bolus, then titrate. If it's required, give, but don't give five cc immediately. You never know what is inside the patient. Sometimes we are doing these procedures in a patient which is not hospitalized. It's outpatient service. General anesthesia, the whole team of interventional pulmonology department should know uh, general anesthesia details and they should have good knowledge of anesthetics. Continuous monitorization is important during the procedures. Uh, oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry, blood pressure, pulse rate and electrocardiogram should be done. An interventional pulmonologist should know the anatomy very well, which anatomy, airway anatomy, airway vessel, airway organ relations, not the cause complications such as perforation and fistula. Don't forget that esophagus has a thin wall and it's just abutting the posterior wall of uh, trachea and left main bronchus, and there are major vessels around the major airways such as aorta, superior vena cava, azigos vein, and pulmonary arteries. Another important point, patient may have anatomical changes by surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. Maybe hilum won't be in the proper place or natural place after surgery or radiotherapy because there's retraction. Be careful about high complication risk. There are many, but for example, uh, patients having involvement of pulmonary artery, involvement of posterior wall of the airway, trachea, bronchi, cardiac problems uh, can cause risky situations. You should be careful about them. There are not so many complications due to interventional bronchoscopic procedures. Uh, in good hands, the complication rate is around 4%, adverse events, 2%, death rate less than 1%, but look at the 30-day mortality. It's high, 15%, ranging between 8 to 20%. What are the risk factors? Urgent emergent procedures, repeated bronchoscopy, moderate sedation. Moderate sedation looks paradoxical, but when you are giving moderate sedation, 
you are kind of missing the, uh, some dangers coming from the patient. Moderate sedation by itself is not causing danger, but you are kind of not recognizing uh, the coming risks. Uh, again, the anesthesiology scores, if they are high, intrinsic mixed obstruction and stent placement can be risky uh, factors. Another study by Arms, Armin Erst and colleagues also showed similar results. The 30-day mortality and morbidity is not very low. Which patients have more complications? Patients with malignant disease, patients having diseases in trachea, diabetes patients, and COPD patients. So there should be good quality control in medical application. Management of complications is important. To manage the complications, you should be ready for the complication. You should have all the instruments ready for the complication, and not the, only the doctor. All team should have this knowledge, and there should be good experience in endotracheal intubation and rigid bronchoscopy. There are so many complications mentioned here. It shouldn't scare you, but they can happen, although not in high incidence. You should know, and when they can appear, and should be ready. We should validate our outcomes after the procedure on the first day, on the first month, third month, sixth month. But technical success, getting the obstruction out, opening the airway, it's not enough by itself. We should, we should also have clinical success. Clinical success and technical success should be together. How do we assess the clinical success? It's exercise capacity. Maybe you should look at six-minute walk test, lung function, quality of life some appropriate questionnaires regarding the symptoms, and we should also assess the cost effectiveness. Quality, quality in IP team, equipment, logistics, IP procedures, also quality of life should be included in the studies related to interventional bronchoscopy. Education and training in interventional pulmonology is important. It should be structured, innovative training of the team. It should be done in high volume training centers, otherwise, Seeing a few patients won't give much training to the uh, person uh, going to learn these procedures. Faculty development, train the trainer programs, state of the art research, and guidelines will help in education and training. There should be also quality lessons. We should use simulation and mannequins in training the uh, IP fellows, and the training should not be the old type, the apprenticeship type. It should be done on simulations and mannequins because all type of training, uh, learning three bronchoscopies and then going and doing it in your department uh, is not good. It causes complications and also it increases time, sedation and complications during the bronchoscopy. The education and training should be competency-based education because not everybody learns at the same rate. Some people need 10 bronchoscopies to learn. Some people may need 100 bronchoscopies. So the uh, training should be competency-based. And we should have evidence-based standardized curriculum and research infrastructure. Reflective practice is important in training uh, in interventional pulmonology. What is it? You do the procedure, and then the whole team, after the procedure, go to a room. And in that room, the doctor, nurse, technician, all together mention about the procedure. They mention about the weaknesses, complications, good sides, success. Nobody is mentioned in name, but they have a good reflection of the procedure they have done, and they plan for the future uh, procedures to get better. This is called reflect, reflective practice. Uh, a recommendation doing uh, interventional pulmonary procedures, be modest. Do not be too enthusiastic to open the whole airway. We need some patent lumen. Don't try to open the whole airway. For example, the tumor may be necrotic, may be have maybe having a base in the posterior membrane. If you are too enthusiastic, young, energetic, open the uh, door, and then you open, um, open a 
place in trachea, posterior membrane, you can have a fistula. So you are not trying to get rid of everything. You are just opening an airway. Be modest in interventional procedures. If possible, combine methods to increase effect and decrease complications. Close follow-up, marrying the patient is important. Maybe it depends on the patient, but you check one or three days later than periodically. Avoid charring in hot treatments in laser and electrocautery. This is not our aim. Do coagulation and plus add mm. mechanical debulking. You can do it with the bevel of rigid bronchoscope or forceps. So just coagulation, get rid of bleeding, and it shrinks the tumor or the lesion and then debulk. You can combine Amen. treatments, interventional treatments with each other, or you can do interventional treatment and do radiotherapy, maybe chemotherapy, or very few patients, but some patients can go to surgery after interventional procedures. In conclusion, what I mean, we should have a rational patient-centered optimal approach comprised of initial evaluations, procedural strategies and planning, procedural techniques and results, and long-term management plan, which means good clinical practice. I think this should be in every part of medicine. We should choose most suitable approach for each patient, which is tailored, selective, multimodality, increasing quality of life, and cost-effective. And this should be a multidisciplinary approach with dynamic interaction of pulmonology, pathology, radiology, thoracic surgery, ear, nose, throat, doctors, anesthesia, medical oncology, and radiation oncology. In conclusion, I will uh, finish my talk with the words of Dr. Atul Mehta. For all interventional pulmonary diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, because it could be done, it doesn't mean it should be done. Lung ailments is an international phenomenon, more so in developing countries. Our recommendations should be inclusive of all considerations. Reducing healthcare cost is civic responsibility. Be aware of the procedure in search of a CPD code. This means reimbursement of the procedure because money should come to the hospital so that you do your procedure in good quality. And the last words, no procedure should be performed just to maintain the skills of the interventional pulmonologist. And I invite you to the sixth European Congress for Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology, which will be done in Athens, Greece in 2021, April 22, 24th. Uh, my friend Grigoris Stratakos will organize the meeting and we are expecting you there. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Semra, for uh, the extensive uh, review of the intervention pulmonology. And for the sake of, of time, I will let the questions afterward, if you please. And I would like to uh, ask uh, our friend, Dr. Alice Rosman, to um, give his talk about how to avoid complications in thoracoscopy. Uh, thank you very much once again. I think we are run out of time and I'll try to be as quick as possible here with the complication in thoracoscopy. If you go to a literature, we see a long list what can happen in thoracoscopy, but let's go. I just, I just divided uh, this complication into the five major groups. The first one is associated with the poor patient selection. The second one with the poor technique, unexperienced uh, doctor. Then there is a lot of questioning about pleural disease and safety and so on then the lung expansion and anesthesia and sedation. So if you go into a textbook, first we see this chart. Beware of the patients who cough severely and we cannot uh, stop this cough because uh, it's practically for sure these patients after the procedures will have subcutaneous emphysema. Then don't do thoracoscopy in patients with severe coagulation disorders, severe respiratory failure and important pleural adhesions. And if the patient has pathology on both sides, both lung involvements or bilateral effusion, these are risky patients. And if you can get diagnosis another way, then do it like another way. So uh, poor patient selection, usually patients who have obesity, hypoxemia, hypercapnia is even more dangerous. Uh, I already mentioned the contralateral disease like fibrothorax on the other side of the lung and so on and so on. 
just go briefly. And I'll just show you one case where the poor patient selection make a, make a problem. So this is a study published 15 years ago with patients with moderate and severe COPD and spontaneous pneumothorax who went under medical thoracoscopy to get type pleurodesis. It was 49 patients. What we see at the end is the striking high mortality rate, 10%. Usually the mortality rate in thoracoscopy is as low as in transbronchial biopsy. This is much below 1%, like 0.1 or 0.2%. And if you analyze this data, why these patients, what was so wrong with that? We see that patients who died have significantly uh, reduced uh, lung function Diffusion capacity was very, very low, and all the patients had ischemic heart disease. And the patient didn't die immediately in, uh, during the procedure, but later, because of pneumonia, COPD exacerbation, one because of myocardial infarction. So we see that people with ischemic heart disease and low respiratory uh, capacity have a high risk for complications. So the next group is poor thoracoscopy technique. Either when we introduce the troca and we hit the lung or some other structure and, in, and produce the bleeding, or if we try to induce the pneumothorax and we insufflate the air into the vessel instead of the pleural cavity, there's bleeding, infection, and so on and so on. So this is the problem of, of thoracoscopy. So for just a brief safety advisement, use, always use ultrasound before you start the pneumothorax to see whether the lung are adhesive to the uh, chest wall or there is uh, a layer of the pleural fluid in between. And if you are not sure, and if you don't see that uh, there is a sliding sign of the lung or a layer of the pleural fluid, perform the pneumothorax rather with the fluoroscopy that you see that the lung goes away from the, uh, from the chest wall then blunt dissection and uh, the troca can be safely inserted. If the lungs are attached to the chest wall where you want to insert a troca, you may go through the chest wall and through the lungs and induce severe bleeding. Bleeding is a problem, especially in the patients with coagulation disorders. So check first whether the patient's coagulate Coagulation status is okay. If thrombocytes are okay, if patient takes any anticoagulant and antithrombotic drugs, and if a patient takes them, then go uh, along the protocol and uh, discontinue the drugs uh, before the procedure. Sometimes there is also surprise in the pleural space, a lot of neoangiogenesis and pathological vasculature, and here one have to be very careful uh, because these vessels can bleed very severely because usually come from the intercostal vessels. Third group are complications of the pleural, uh, of the pleural disease. Uh, there were described cases of acute respiratory stress syndrome and pneumonia, possible activation of systemic coagulation and also activation of systemic inflammatory response. There was a lot of talk uh, in the late 90s before the year 2000 whether targ pleural disease is safe. Because reports, especially from the United States, come that there are cases of respiratory failure, IRDS syndrome, and some patients also died. And then was a study published in 1991, 99, where the uh, uh, targ pleural was done in rats, and it was discovered that targ is everywhere in the body in each possible organ, not just in the pleural space. So after a review of uh, 32 cases in the literature with RDS and so, it was advised that TARC should be discontinued for the pleural disease. But what was the case? This study published at the same time, or actually a few years later, randomized TARC uh, with uh, um, graded TARC with uh, large particles uh, against the mixed talc with small particles. And the problem of talc is that if you take two small particles of the talc, this talc is absorbed and uh, trafficked all around the body, and you can get RDS syndromes and some other syndromes and systemic inflammatory response as well. But if talc particles are big enough, they don't leave the uh, pleural cavity and stay there and they are safe. So we have many proofs. For example, like SOTIM study, safety of talc in malignant pleural effusion, European study, uh, made with calibrated French talc, more than 500 patients included, but no case of acute respiratory distress syndrome. And again, one step further, a talc pleural disease in more than 400 patients uh, for patients with spontaneous uh, secondary or primary pneumothorax, uh, more healthier patients even, and again, there were no cases of respiratory failure and RDS syndrome. But there are concerns in the literature that if a TAC can introduce, can induce the inflammatory response in the pleura, this inflammatory response can be spilled 
out from the pleural space all around the body and also activate the coagulation cascade because inflammatory and coagulation cascades are uh, not completely separate biochemical mechanisms. And again, we see this actually a small study of activation systemic inflammatory response after pleural disease. We clearly see that if the patient has uh, pleural disease, not just thoracoscopy, the lower line is just thoracoscopy, the upper line thoracoscopy is pleural disease. Usually there's transitional increased body temperature, white blood cells are increased and CRP is increased. These are all the signs of systemic inflammatory response. And if you have a very comorbid or old patient, this can be a significant and this can be a water who spills over the glass. Fourth group are complications of lung expansion, uh, like expansion of pulmonary edema or complication associated with unexpandable lung, prolonged air leak, subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, Re-expansion edema is very rare. We see it not very often, but very, very rare. Maybe I saw one or two patients with so-called re-expansion edema, but I think this is more a case of ventilatory perfusion mismatch. If we have a large pleural effusion or large pleomothorax and we expand it rapidly, the lungs are ventilated and the blood, uh, and, uh, but, but um, actually are ventilated, but the transi transition of the gases is not completely restored in the first few hours because lungs were collapsed for, for some time. And there is uh, increase of pulmonary pressure and we have a shunt and that's the cause of the, uh, the uh, such uh, case. Here we have uh, a CT proven case of re-expansion pulmonary edema on the right side when we tried to re-expand, actually this was a little bit of trapped lung, we removed a liter and a half of pleural effusion, we see the X-ray before and after. One would not expect that in this case we would have this, but we have, we had. So you see the enlarged pulmonary vessels and also on CT scan, because the patient was in respiratory failure, we see that uh, edema is possible, but very rare. The situation which we fear most is uh, trapped lung or lung entrapment when lungs are not re-expanded after the thoracoscopy, especially in malignant pleural effusion. If you have this situation after thoracoscopy, this is a cause uh, for, for, this can cause very severe complications. Lung cannot be re-expanded, pleurodesis is not possible. If we remove the chest tube, the patient will cough and get a huge subcutaneous emphysema. If you try to increase the pleural pressure to more negative, we risk the formation of the fistula. When we have a fistula, we can't remove the chest tube. If we cannot remove the chest tube, we have all the time leakage of the air from, uh, from the airway to the pleural space and out through the chest tube. And in the matter of days, we can get the infection and the empyema. And this is very bad for the patient with malignancy because they cannot be treated. So in this case, we tried just to remove the chest tube and you see what happened, a huge subcutaneous emphysema and the uh, chest tube should be reinstalled back. The fifth and the last group are complication of anesthesia and sedation. For me, pain is complication of the procedure. We have a means that we perform the procedure painless and we should do that. Uh, and patients should not suffer and complain uh, about the pains during the procedures. So, but there are also uh, other uh, complications associated with overdoses of lidocaine and uh, allergic reaction, hypoventilation, hypo uh, tension associated with systemic uh, analgesia. So when patient appear during the procedure, the red line is if we perform the procedure completely without any anesthesia. When we said the pneumothorax hurts, when there we introduce a trocar even more and then biopsies are painful and the pleural disease can, be, can, introduce, can produce a huge pain if there are large areas of healthy pleura. So if we perform the local, good local anesthesia, the patient feels just the insertion of the needle and anesthesia and then should be everything calm. And if we also perform an intercostal block uh, during the procedure, there are also small amounts of pain, but can avoid a huge pains for biopsies and special pleural disease. Patient usually requires some uh, level of intravenous uh, sedation as well to be calm during the procedure. Here is just briefly a reminder of anatomy. We have to uh, anesthetize the intercostal nerve and uh, if possible to introduce the blockage of the intercostal nerve. Usually do this with 2% of lidocaine. Duration of action is one to two hours. We have also drug bupivacaine with double uh, half-life and uh, this can be, uh, effect can be longer. And if we add some epinephrine in a very low concentration, we can extend the time when the uh, patient is in anesthesia. 
Here is one method once described in the literature, but not, I think, repeated, spray catheter technique for pleuronesthesia, especially uh, for pain control before target put rush. I'll show you how this looks like. We just take a spray catheter and we spray the pleural space with the lidocaine, but here is the danger, danger that we will go above the limitation of the, the highest possible dose, like for, for 30 milligrams of lidocaine, and we can have side effects because we uh, added too much lidocaine to the pleural space. The method is a little bit effective, but not so effective, uh, so uh, the talc later is still painful. So uh, we use usually another technique, which is uh, intercostal nerve block. We use bupivacaine with adrenaline, and we perform the intercostal nerve block during the procedure. You will see how simple this is from inner side. Uh, here we have a, a, a intercostal nerve and the vessel. This is a completely healthy pleura in the patient with repeated spontaneous pneumothoraxes, uh, where we uh, uh, perform the, the tag pleurodesis, and this would be very, very painful. So we take a sterile needle, we just insert the needle below the parietal pleura, very, not very deeply, and we just inject a milliliter or two of the uh, anesthetics in the vicinity of the nerve, and we have a complete nerve block. Uh, and we can go uh, one intercostal space after another, and we can exercise eight or nine intercostal spaces in the matter of a minute and a half or two minutes, and this is an excellent anesthesia for, for such kind of pleural disease. So I'll just skip, the, we have two studies about uh, use of propofol in the, uh, in the, in the, during the thoracoscopy when, uh, with, uh, by non-specialist. The first one, the Swiss one, was, was okay. They were trained nurses. They uh, applied boluses of propofol, one to two milliliter uh, uh, during the procedures. Uh, and the patient was monitored by B-spectrum monitoring. And the results were okay. So the, uh, there, were no there were very low complication rate, but not, not, uh, no one from this was enough to, to, to uh, stop the procedure. And the conclusion was that the uh, BIS-guided propofol sedation in non-specialists can be very helpful in a medical thoracoscopy. The other one, randomized between midazolam and propofol, uh, was a little bit less successful because there was statistical significance between groups uh, in uh, hypoxia and hypotension. But as you see here, 93% of saturation against 96% of saturation. Is this clinically important? I don't know, but I think uh, this was uh, differences was, were not clinically so, so important since no procedure had to be aborted at the end. So, um, okay, I will just conclude for the matter of time. Um, more complication, main complication in medical thoracoscopy are, as I already mentioned, uh, associated with the poor patient selection if the patients are too ill to go to such a procedure, if the operator is not skillful because uh, doesn't have proper training or uh, enough procedures, so uh, operator can cause bleeding and infection and so on and so on. Pleural disease can be pretty safe if you use graded talc. Lung re-expansion can be a problem, so I ad advise to perform the uh, pleural manometry before such a procedures. Uh, sedation anesthesia, if properly made, uh, can be quite okay, but uh, for me, pain is also a complication. So all of them can be avoided with proper technique and careful approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice, for keeping up with the time. Very excellent. Um, uh, we have to move on to the next session. Um, and I would like to call Dr. Ayman Abdel Zahir and uh, Dr. Tariq Safa to chair the first session.